you have Lego robots, you're going to get them to drive them. It'll be fine. Nothing can go wrong here. <laughs> It's just a really good experience to have someone different showing them all this extra stuff that I know nothing about, so it's great to have this extra knowledge. Getting to use the actual robot because I've never used one, it's interesting to see how it works. Funnily enough, after 20 years in science doing your particular topic, you are the expert in the room on your topic. I'm Louise Dennis. I'm a research associate at the University of Liverpool. For a long time, I was um, secretary of the UK Artificial Intelligence Society. And so we had quarterly meetings. And every meeting, we'd all sit there and say, we must do something about getting artificial intelligence into schools. Um, we want more people doing our subject. We want more students. We want more excitement. We want less suspicion, because obviously there's a lot of concern about artificial intelligence as well. And then quite by chance, I found out about the Stemming Bastard Scheme. Science, technology, engineering and mathematics, which are all very modern and important subjects, but are often perceived as being very difficult or tricky in some sense. I think it's very important that everybody has at least a basic grounding in these subjects, and the more people who know more about them, the better. My activity involves a Lego robot um, that has to talk via Bluetooth to a computer. It's a simulation of a planetary rover, such as the Mars Curiosity. The aim is to show some of the challenges that are faced when you're trying to operate one of these, and also introduce artificial intelligence style programming so that the robot can make its own decisions. So there's a variety of ways that I may talk to the school before I, I turn up and it depends on time constraints and preferences and what I'm planning to do. So it may be an email conversation, a phone conversation, or I may actually go and meet the school in advance. What I thought I'd do first is I'll give you a little demo, show you what I'll do, okay. and then we can talk a bit about how it will fit in with your science club. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. When you're going into schools, it's, it's useful to be aware that what you think you're doing may not be what they think you're doing. Okay. <laughs> so Ideally, from a teacher's point of view, it would be great if the ambassador could come in maybe the week before, have a chat about what they're going to do, and we could give them any constructive feedback about how we'd want them to change it or appeal to our pupils. That would be perfect. Before I go into the school, I will fire up all the computers and robots that have talked to each other and make sure that they are, they are still talking to each other today. because. In any of these situations, something may have changed in the setup of the computer, and you just want to check before you go in that everything is, is going to be working. I'm a little bit nervous. We've made some changes to the activity since last time we ran it, so it'll be very interesting to see how they react to that, and it was particularly to emphasise more of the artificial intelligence aspects. So I'm sort of quite interested to see whether they respond well to those changes, or if it's a horrible disaster. <laughs> Hey guys, come in, let's check our bags on the side. It's always great when we get ambassadors in uh, to like inspire the kids because sometimes they get a bit bored of me teaching them, especially in a STEM club environment. They used to have me as a science teacher, um, so sometimes it's hard to kind of distinguish between like lessons and, and extracurricular stuff. So uh, it really helps having ambassadors come in to share their enthusiasm and, and the students obviously see it in a different way. It kind of, it's not just coming from their teacher who always teaches them science, but they get something from somebody who does it elsewhere. Uh, and can share their expertise. Um, so what I want to talk to you about today is some of the challenges and solutions for operating planetary rovers like the Mars Curiosity rover. My intuition is between two and four children per robot works really well. If you're only with one child then they don't get any interaction and they feel more exposed and often they're less sure what to do. The moment you've got two, they have a conversation about what they want to do with the robot or what they think, and they can take turns, and it just generates um, more interaction with the activity. If you were in a mission control at NASA, what you'd have is a screen for driving the robot from. So you've got a screen here, and there's some simple commands at the top. 
Stop. <laughs> Do you want to put it on the floor? Yeah. Once you get above four on a robot, they're all clustered around the laptop screen. And, and often you start getting to the point where one person begins to dominate. You know, I, I am the person who is good at computers in this group and I will do everything. And then you'll notice the others start to wander away and play with the Lego. So more than four, it gets a bit difficult. Yeah. Another thing the STEM ambassador scheme always makes sure is there is a teacher in the room with you. And I find it very useful, if there's something like that, to take the cue from them. I, I've been in groups where a teacher has warned me beforehand that there is a child with particular difficulties, and we've usually agreed how we'll deal with that. I mean, you try and make sure that you are talking to everybody. And the options are an obstacle at the front, an obstacle at the back, or a middle sort of the light sensor. You do need to switch the rule on as well. And then it's a matter of just making sure that you're, you're answering everybody's questions, and you're not making fun of anybody's questions. You know, all questions are good questions. So you've got three sensors on NOR. You've got um, an ultrasonic sensor. Uh, this one is just a basic touch sensor, so if that gets pressed anywhere, then it presses this and it sends a, a signal. Where's and down here, sensor? we've got a light intensity sensor. Yeah. I mean, I've become very enthusiastic about the STEM ambassador scheme, and so I mean, I've been back to my department and I've talked about what I do, and my department has actually a range of resources that help with the activity I run, but also pushing the STEM idea um, we've arranged for all our PhD students now to receive a talk from the local STEM contract holder. And what we're hoping is that a lot of them will sign up to be ambassadors and that we will be able to let them use the activity I've developed um, because it links into the departmental research and they'll be able to go out to schools as well. So, you know, if you were on Mars and suddenly something's in the way and your operator's too far away to get the signal, you could have the robot automatically stop. Working with the Lego robots, we've realised there are things we can do with these as research platforms, which we might not have been prompted to do if I hadn't been doing a lot of work with them to try and create a STEM activity. And actually, I've broken it out when we've had people from industry wandering around and we're trying to just convey the basic idea, and that was something we weren't really expecting. So now, if you, if you try and send the robot a command... <laughs> she doesn't bite. <laughs> so computing has a very interesting history when it comes to women. So actually, in the early days of computing, it was a woman's job. So the, the very first professional programmers were female. Uh, the very first computer program was written by a woman. And so there was this very sort of before the 1960s, strong female presence in computing and programming, which then vanished, almost. I mean, I feel part of what I do is, is just be a woman who's involved in computing and excited about computing. And, and it's, that's just at the level of role models. So this is a time delay that I'm setting. Uh, it's 1,300 milliseconds, which is just over a second, and that's the time it takes for radio signal to get from Earth to the moon. Do you want to have a go? I'll be impressed if you can drive it around the stools now. What do I enjoy about it? I do like performing. So, I mean, I, I do enjoy actually being out there, interacting with people, either giving a presentation or talking about the robots. I mean, I get a big kick out of that. I'm not pretending I don't. Um, but also, it's becoming more and more important as an academic scientist to just demonstrate that your research has impact. So that's all how people know what I do. Um, people know I'm the person to go to if you need a Lego robot to go and do something. So it's had a lot of knock-on effects at that level. I think it's engaged them again. Um, they've done a lot of robotics recently, um, but in a diff different slant. They've built robots rather than programming them. So I think this has re-engaged them in robotics um, and, and shown them that actually programming isn't as daunting as it seems because you saw the kids there at the very start. They looked at that screen and thought, oh, my God, that's really scary. Um, but in reality, it's not. And within, you know, what, 10, 20 seconds, they were all driving robots around the room. I thought it was great because we get to learn other things. I think it's more interesting because you're used to the same teacher and you know like what they're going to do. And whereas you meet someone different and you learn new things. We've done a robot competition before and in our competition the two competitors both had the Lego robots so they were really interested to see how they work and possibly um, to use them for next year. So this is exactly what we wanted to show them how they can expand on their robot knowledge and how next year 
fingers crossed we could use this sort of sensor system and make it a more advanced robot. So it's been brilliant today.